For this and other messages, contact Refuge Bookshop, number 19, Mayura Road, Nabi Plaza, opposite Zikta Model Schools, Barnawa, Kaduna. Telephone numbers 0805-845-5719-0703-456-8035. Email address threshesteam at yahoo.com or you could visit our website at www.threshesteam.org.ng Tonight again, as we gather to you, your mind is for us to succeed. We therefore beg you to show us the way of success. Show us the door wherein we must enter if we must succeed. Do not leave us to waste our lives do not leave us to fail. We trust you, Holy Spirit, that you will show us Jesus again. And as we follow in his footsteps, grant that we shall know success in our lives. Thank you for opening our eyes to behold wondrous things out of the word of God tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. It. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Tonight, um, I thought we would start a little bit early so that we can have a little bit of an interaction. What I've discovered is that ministers really have time to share, to relate, time to relax a bit. Many a time we are too busy. People keep knocking on your life, people keep coming for counseling, for ministry, for prayer. And one thing or the other. So many a time we are under pressure and we really have time to share together, to pray together, to even relax. And it's a very big trouble uh, that somebody can even collapse on the pulpit. Don't be surprised. That sometimes you have not even eaten, but you will not know. That we don't normally have time to take care of ourselves. And that's why we call you out again and say, please, let's have some few evenings just to sit around, share together, and, and see whether we can be refreshed and be reinvigorated. And so we called ourselves out. And thank you for coming. Uh, this meeting is uh, titled, the theme of this meeting is Good Success. Yesterday we said, it is good to succeed. Nobody wants to fail. Am I correct? To succeed means to achieve a certain goal. We're not going to be looking at the parameters for success, like we said. Um, uh, we will just face the matter of... Uh, no, we're not going to look at assessment. We're just going to continue to pray that God will help us to succeed. It is not good to be doing something and there is no achievement, there is no progress, there is no, um, there is no growth, there is no advancement. It is not good. If God asks you ask to do something for him or you, are, you, are, you set out to do something, over the time there should be progress. If there's no progress, there's a need for you to come back and reassess. Why is it? Because if you plant a tree, you expect that over the time you will see the tree grow and bring forth fruit. But when you don't see success, it's not good to keep going. Of course, I've said the parameters and the, and the way to assess success I see in our generation may not be correct. But yet, we want to succeed. If you're a student and you're getting F, 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 that's not success. If you're a trader and you're becoming bankrupt, your business is always closing down, that is not success. If you're a family man and your children are spoiling, things are not going well, there's no happiness in the family, that's not success. God is, God's mind is for us to succeed to prosper, to show that what we are doing is growing. 
So, that's why we call this meeting. Some of us have labored for years. And you can adduce many reasons and say, this is why I'm not succeeding. But that's not the issue. The issue is that if you are doing something, after some time, you, you should post profit. You should flourish. So, we're going to go again. Yesterday, we looked at the book of Joshua, chapter, chapter 1. That's our text. Verses 1 through 9. Joshua is the book after Deuteronomy. Hallelujah. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is what? Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, unto the land which I do give thee, them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From this Lebanon, I mean from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great sea, unto the great river, the river of Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you, and I will not forsake you. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto these people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses thy servant commanded thee. Turn not from me to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, Thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Praise the Lord. And we drew an outline yesterday. We said, because we can't finish the key to success in this passage, we can't finish it this weekend. We now say we drew an outline and we say everybody should go and study in case you are prepared to succeed. And let me say it, prayer is critical for success. If you ask, you will receive. But prayer alone will not give you success. If you don't build according to pattern, if you don't follow the, the, law, the law that Moses gave you, if you don't operate according to the principles of the word of God, you will not succeed. Your success will not be a divine success. So we all pray and we came to pray and we say, God, please give me a breakthrough. Give me success. Prosper my work. I want to see success. Good success. There is bad success. When you succeed without God, that is what they call bad success. success. The Bible says the prosperity of the wicked will slaughter him. Some people are apparently succeeding, but they are not succeeding. Numbers is not primarily a parameter for success. It's not. It's not primarily a judge of success. So, we drew an outline. The first outline we drew was number one. From this passage, we saw that there must be adequate what? Preparation. Adequate preparation. Eh? I will not go back on that message. You will get it when you get the, 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 the CD. What's number two outline? Communion with God. You must be a man that communes with God if you are going to succeed in life. You are going to succeed 
especially in any spiritual work. But our success is not just for spiritual work. We are trusting God that you will succeed in every sphere. Hallelujah. What's number three outline? Huh? Vision. What's number four outline? I didn't hear you. The word that put in the ministry. What's number five sock outline? God's divine presence. What's number six outline? Boldness. Any man that will succeed in the ministry must be bold. He must be strong and what? Courageous. Timid men, they don't normally succeed quickly. Men that are not decisive. And when they know what to do, they don't go ahead to do it and execute it. He says, he says, wherever the sole of your foot shall tread. And then finally, what's the last thing we saw? The word of God. So we will go on. Um, I know we will never be able to finish this. I will stop at a junction, at a juncture, and I would like you to ask questions. I would like you to make your own comments. I would like to bless, be blessed also because that's why we gathered. Actually, this meeting was not to be one-sided. It was supposed to be an interactive session. But because of shortness of time, let me go on. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, I hope I'm not overemphasizing this, that Moses is who? And Joshua is who? Servant of Moses. This is critical. And even though ecclesiastical education, classroom education is very important, if you want to succeed, you need to tell us who is your Moses? Who brought you up? Very critical, very crucial. As long as the heir is a child, you must be under governors and tutors. It has become very critical. Please, there are seats at the back. And if we have filled that place, let them come to the back now. Somebody should be around to, to introduce them. But it's not, this, this, is, this is one of the pastors of the church. Please take your seat somewhere at this corner. Or you come and sit down here if you like. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. You can't put a pastor of the church at the back. This place is for people who will not see them in the video at all. They are at the back. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we said it. We have a heavenly father. Are we have, do we have a heavenly father? We also have what? An earthly father. Those who have not been good children to their earthly father, they cannot be good children to the heavenly father. The God you have not seen, if you want to do well with him, you have to be, you have to, you have to first of all, understand the one that you have seen. Hallelujah. Are we together? It's a spiritual principle. God gave human, God gave us human fathers. God could have said, no, I don't need to give you human fathers. But in his wisdom, he gave us human parents, human masters, human teachers to help us to be able to be good students of the Father. And if you don't submit to a human authority, you will never submit to God. The way to learn to submit the human authority that you see, I mean, the, the one you have not seen, submitted the one you see. That's why he said he set the solitary in families, human, human families, in communities. And so please, when Jesus began to preach and to teach, he began to select 12 men to be his apprentice so that they would be able to stand for him after he has finished. Now, we can't overemphasize this. Preparation is too important in anything you are going to do in life. To be a good mother, you have to be prepared for it. To be a good father, you have to be prepared for it. To be a good minister, and if you like to succeed, to be a good trader, you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to be prepared for it. Anything you are going to do, that's why they have schools. School is one avenue to prepare people. And Education is so critical. 
But I want to, I want to add practical education that is geared towards pro solving problems. Because life is full of problems. So, if you cannot tell us your antecedents, where you are coming from, how you are trained before you enter the ministry, that may be the reason why you are not having success. Are you with me? Are you with me? I said to you yesterday that nowadays there's a trick people are playing. They say, my mentor, my mentor, my mentor. When you pin them down very well, you discover that the person that I call him mentor is in America, who they have never seen before. A person you have never seen in your life cannot, cannot be your, your father in the Lord. Are you hearing me? Uh, the person that is likely to be a good father in the Lord is somebody that has contact with you, that eats with you, that supervises what you are doing, that disciplines you, that rehearses the word of God before your ears. So, if you have not had that kind of experience, you may not have been adequately prepared. When it is time for you to now be in charge, your deficiencies will become clear. Eh? So, women fellowship leader, the trouble you are having problem with many women in this female fellowship is not because you are not of age, it's because maybe your training is deficient. Is that okay? Is that okay? So we finish with verse 1. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is there none therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all these people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel, and so on and so forth. Every place that the soul of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I have said unto Moses. And the second point we said is communion. Now if you look at the Bible, verses 1 to 9, is a secret discussion between Almighty God and Joshua. Is that all right? Is that all right? Eh? It's a secret discussion. It's a secret communion. It's a secret interaction between who? Almighty God and who? And Joshua. This is crucial. This is critical. If you want to succeed in life, you want to succeed in the ministry, then your relationship with Almighty God must be very, very, very close. Your connection with Almighty God must never be allowed to break. Nothing must come between you and Him. It must be a growing relationship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Eh? And you must have a secret closet life. Many ministers are too much in the public. They don't have a secret closet life. They don't have an inner chamber. They keep ministering to others, but they don't know the way to the city. That would say wisdom is profitable to direct. And this wisdom is how do I get back to the city? Because that is where they sharpen a man's life. Amen. If you look at the book of Matthew, chapter 6, where Jesus was training the apostles, he was training them. The someone on the mount, you will discover that Jesus taught them a lot. He was training them. Now, let's look at that very quickly. I read a few verses. Take heed. Have you seen Matthew chapter 6? What the Bible says, Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your father which is where. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, hmm, they have their what? But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thine arms may be in secret, that thy father who sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, 
What should you do? Thou shouldest. Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing where? And the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou prayest, what do you do? Enter into where? And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which sees in secret. And the Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, if you don't practice this, if this is not your practice, don't expect success. Eh? If you look at that place, the Bible keeps saying, you have no reward. Otherwise, you have no reward. Otherwise, you have no success. If everything you do is for public consumption, eh? Eh? Are you hearing me? If everything you do is for what? Public consumption. There is no reward. If you give things to people so that others will see you, there is no reward. If you pray, if you preach to create impression with others, there is no reward. If you pray so that other people will see that you are a prayer warrior, there is no what? If you sing to impress people, there is no reward. What God rewards is what is done where? In secret. Hallelujah. All the men you saw or you see that succeeded, they started success in secret. But when they began to succeed, they became public and everything finished. Amen. Most of the people that you see today who have become great men and women of God, they began with fasting, they began with prayer, they began with studying, they began with a secret life with God. They shut their closet and they spent time in God's presence. But when they began to become successful, so to speak, many of them wouldn't go back to the closet. They became public. All they did was to be seen by men. And God described such a person as what? A hypocrite. He says, the father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Is that alright? Where does God look? When God is going around looking for who he will bless, where does he go? To the secret places. So man of God, in case there is no more communion, if your communion is only on the outside, if your communion with God is only on the outside, there is no more secret closet life, no more inner chamber. When God anoints a man, God anoints a man in the inner chamber. And if you want to maintain the anointing of God, where do you maintain it? Inner chamber. Once you become public, you become a Pharisee, a hypocrite. And we have learned not to do things quietly. Everything we do is for men to see us and clap for us. Some of you are, some of you are, 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 are very surprised that we didn't clap for the choir. I will clap for them. Let me clap for them. There's nothing wrong with it. Eh? There's nothing wrong with clapping for choir. If choir bless you, in some churches you raise your hand. Some churches you clap. I don't have anything against it. But if they don't clap for you and you get annoyed, then there's a big problem with your life. Because it means you are singing so that men will see you. Anything you do in this life, and it is geared towards the fact that men will see you and acknowledge you, you have no reward for it. So there are many men that they don't pray in their houses, they pray only in church. That's a very deficient life. You will not succeed. Because God only rewards what is done. We are in secret. Hallelujah. If you don't have a secret closet life where you enjoy with eating with God all the time, you enjoy it, then you have a deficient life. And this church of nowadays is becoming very public. It depends so much on public opinion. Their measure of success is how many people saw you. 
And so many people have no closet life. There's no inner chamber. All they do is to be seen by men. So their prayer, their Bible study, everything is to be seen by men. And we begin to raise church members who don't have a private relationship with God. Can I inform you? Even though I'm afraid to tell you because some of you will say I'm preaching against you. All this your early morning due that you invite church members to come to church at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning and therefore nobody has a time alone with God. You are training deficient people. The relationship with God is more important than that thing you are doing. If it is once in a while, but if it is your regular way of life to people to come to church early in the morning so that they can have morning due. And they are, they are not trained to have a personal, private relationship with God. They are not training them well. Are you following me? Eh? The first thing you should train your church members and your disciples and your flock to do is to have a personal relationship with God and grow in it. That is what is going to give them an authority when they come out to preach. A man that does not sing at home. I hope you will sing at home before you come to church. I'm, I'm very serious though, because some of you don't sing at home. I'm going to ask your wife whether you sang with her before you came to sing here. Because many people, what they do is only public. Huh? Actually, many people don't sing in the church. I mean, don't sing at home. Once we get home, the, the environment at home becomes very tense. All the songs you sing at home is songs that they used to fight. You know when a woman and a man are, are fighting, that's when the woman sings very wonderful songs. That song is not for God, it's for fighting. Eh? We don't make melody. We don't sing. We don't rejoice at home. But when we come to church, we dance as if to say that is our normal lifestyle. Just because you want to impress your neighbor. That's a vain, useless life. Whatever you didn't do at home that you are doing in church is against you. You are all following me again. Whatever you didn't practice at home that you are trying to practice in church will work against you because you become a hypocrite. What makes a man a hypocrite is that he doesn't have a private relationship with God but a public one. It, it makes God to call you what? Hypocrite. So, tonight I want to say to you, that's very critical. To build up a life of relationship and communion with God in private is too critical and too crucial for your success. God does not trust strangers. You hear what I said? Eh? God does not trust what? I can't trust a stranger. The people you meet occasionally, you cannot, com you cannot commit your life into their hands. You cannot commit your business. They are strangers. God can only trust people who are intimate. Who have intimacy with him. Eh? Who have been coming to him for years. Actually, the way God does is that for the very many years of your life, God does not speak to you about anybody. He speaks to you about yourself. When it is time for you to transit to ministry, now God begins to speak to you about others. But the first speaking God does is to your own life. If God has not spoken to your own life, God will not speak to you about anybody. Are you with me? So what I saw Joshua do in that place is what Joshua normally did before. We saw it in Exodus 33 where Joshua will not leave the tabernacle even when Moses has left. And he was there for years. And it became his constant practice. And when Moses died and there was, there was, there was, there was he didn't know what to do again. He went back to the inner chamber. It was in that retreat that God said, Joshua, arise. Moses is dead. Go over this Jordan, you and these people. You are the one to divide the land for them. And this is going to be the boundary of that land. It was an in, in, inside something. It was not a public thing. Are you following me? Now, those of you who normally, 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 normally come to the pulpit without coming from God's presence. That's a problem. 
Are you hearing me? You are not planning to succeed. Those of you who are becoming professionals. Who is a professional? Who is a professional? An expert who knows what he, he what to do at every time. Every time he knows what to do. An expert preacher who does not need to pray again. Eh? A professional is a man who does not need. Eh? An engineer is a professional person. If he comes here, an engineer will say, Yes, 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 yes. Okay, the one you know is doctor. A professional doctor and doctors are professionals. They don't they don't go to pray when you ask them that you have if you, if you say you have if you say you have you are coughing and sometimes you cough out blood and your eyes are red and your 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 body is becoming weak. What will doctor say to you? Huh? Corona. <laughs> no, it's not corona yet. You can't you can't diagnose corona without going to isolation unit. They first of all isolate you and do some tests before they can. <laughs> uh, and corona is not a frightful disease, actually. That's what I'm understanding. Once you go to a doctor and said, in the evenings I'm very weak, I have fever. Sometimes when I climb upstairs, I lose my breath. And I have lost appetite. Number one, vitamin B complex. Number two, before you even go for tests, I suspect malaria. Chloroquine BD plus two. <laughs> eh? That's what they call a spot diagnosis. They don't need to pray about it. If 10 patients come to them and report the same condition, the same, the same diagnosis, Eh? But in the spirit realm, if you walk like that, you will fail because it's a matter of not by might, not by power, but by what? So those of us who have stopped praying because they have become professionals. As some of you, you think that when you are counseling somebody, you are reading Bible. So open your Bible to the book of Matthew. If you are reading Bible for somebody, you are not reading Bible for yourself. If you are praying for somebody, you are not praying for yourself. So don't be confused that as long as you are in the office, as long as you are counseling, as long as you are praying, as long as you are casting out devils, you are doing spiritual exercise, you are, you are getting something. You are not getting, you are losing. Except it is in private with God that you are having a relationship. Anything you are doing in the ministry is a loss. It's not a gain. If you don't recoup with time, even if you were doing well before, some people's business were doing well before, but suddenly it began to collapse. So this communion is very important. And it is very crucial at some point. Before you enter ministry, you need to find out in communion with God what it is that God wants you to do. And at every strategic point in your life, at every junction, you need to get back again to God and find out what is it. Because you're a servant of a master. Master, what is it that you want me to do? Even when things are not going well, there's no need to be run up and down. Go back to him. But when you don't have, when you have not established this relationship, it becomes difficult to find out, to go back and commune. Yesterday we saw when he said to Moses, come up and be there and I will give you what you will teach. And he sat there for 40 days and Joshua was there learning this principle. Eh? Many of us don't know what it's called to wait upon the Lord. Just to come into God's presence and lie down and spend time waiting upon the Lord. See, those that wait upon the Lord, what happens? Vision ministry. For every one ministry you must do, you must come from God's presence. But more than that, you must have stayed in God's presence for years and God began to speak to you about what you are going to do for Him. And you must maintain that relationship with God. If it begins to cut, then you will begin to diminish. The Bible said, Jesus is the true vine and we are what? The branches. Once you are no longer connected because you are beginning to miss your relationship with God, you are going to begin to see that you are going to begin to wither. 
Say, let your, let your garment always be white and let your head lack no. Some people began to have oil on their head because it's only in relationship with God that God will anoint you. But after some time, they began to, they began to take it for granted and they began to find it difficult even to pray. And when you see sin, you can no longer, you can no longer overcome temptation. You're becoming weak. Your temper is becoming brittle. You are beginning to transfer aggression. All this is an evidence that your relationship with God has a problem. So for a man to succeed and keep succeeding, you cannot diminish. Unfortunately, the trouble is that once you begin to minister and grow in ministry, the demand of human beings on your life becomes so much that <coughs> you may be taking it for granted. You may begin to miss your place on the holy hill. Eh? That's why I normally beg sisters who are not yet married. Maximize your years of being single. Because one day you are going to have three children. It's not going to be the same ball game. Eh? If you have not been reinforced, you're not being strengthened in the inner man. You don't have tensile strength. Small, small things that come on your life, you crumble. You will not go far. You can't carry big things for God. It is those times in God's presence for years that gives you tensile strength. Tensile strength means, oh, there's no column here. This is a freestanding. You see? I know there's a column, but you will not see it. So let me not show you. You cannot see it. You see, what they call a column is a concrete pillar. What is inside the concrete pillar? Iron rods. Those rods are called tensile. Tensile makes it malleable. Tensile makes it that when you put load, it doesn't crumble. It is those times when God's present that God builds into your inner life. Eh? And when you have grown and you are now beginning to carry lives, you don't crumble. So when you have not done that, you are in trouble. And, especially, and even if you have done that, at every point in your life, you must learn to return. When there is a crisis around your life, you must learn to run back. That's what Joshua was doing. But if you are a stranger to God before you enter ministry, you don't have a basis to go back. Maybe somebody this night is going through a crisis. I does not know the way back to the city of God. That will become your trouble. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? And number two, you don't have a Moses. Number three. Number two, one, you don't have a Moses. Number two, you don't know the way back to the city of God. That would be a problem. So this communion is so critical. It must be your lifestyle. It must be what you have been doing before you enter ministry and you continue. And at the point of entering ministry, you must. You must. It's not a, it's not a matter of you must spend some time in God's presence. Eh? I know that before you enter ministry, uh, they called you out in the church or somewhere and they prayed for you and laid hands on you. What do they call that? Ordination. Very correct. But if all the ordination you got is what human being did for you, you will not succeed. There's an inside ordination which God does to a man privately inside. That one comes before they call you out. So when they call you out and they're laying hands, it's because they have recognized that God has done something inside. Are you following me? The people who are laying hands on you and say, yes, we are sure. We know that God has done something inside. It is because of what God has done inside that we're not laying hands on you and saying, go forth, we will stand with you. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, after I finish with communion, and it's in communion that God gives you bodings. It's in communion that God gives you visions. It's in communion that God gives you strategies. It's in communion that God mobilizes your heart. When there's no communion, there's no burden, there's no vision. There's no strategy because if you are going to succeed, you also have to be strategic. I know we cannot, we cannot go to that right away, but please, it's important. So, number three now. Sorry, I'm taking it 
just as it comes. If a man does not know what God called him to do, how does he know when he succeeds? Eh? If a man does not know how God, what God called him to do, how does he know when he succeeds? So for every man that succeeded, all of them knew what they came here to do. They are not guessing. Eh? They told Joshua, Arise, go over this Jordan. Every place that the soul of your future shall trade upon I have given to you. It is you, Joshua, that will divide the whole land for the people of Israel. So if you ask Joshua, say, What are you doing? What will he tell you? I'm going to divide the land for the people of Israel. Say, How do you know that the word God gave me? I wanted to ask you, What word did God give you when you are going to ministry? On what basis are you in the ministry? What's the word of God? You can say, This is what I stand upon. You're not following me. You're not following me. I'm asking you something. Because when people fail in life, sometimes you ask them, say, but they are too arbitrary. They are too they are too arbitrary. They they cannot def- they don't have definitions of life. They, you can't be in the and say, So what did, when did God send you? What did God tell you? Did your wife confirm it with you? All these questions say, Well, I just enter ministry. I just enter ministry. My pastor just told me, say, you are going to be in charge of Bible study, and from there I just become a teacher. Excuse me. <laughs> you are making a mistake. You have to tell us. Joshua was very clear. Is that all right? Even though Moses had told him oh, years back that they are going to lead these people across the Jordan, and you are the one that is going to divide the land for them, that's not enough. God also had to do what? To confirm it. Even you and your wife, if a man is trying to run a vision and he didn't tell his wife what he's doing, will he succeed? Huh? He will try to succeed. You are trying to, you are trying to do a big project. And your wife is not supporting you because she doesn't know what you are doing. Do you think you will succeed? Huh? You are shaking your head as if to say, maybe. Maybe I will succeed. Can I tell you the result? You will not succeed. Huh? In case you are thinking you will succeed, each time God tells you what to do, and you have seen it clearly. You must tell your wife. Your wife is your co-pastor. Whether they call her a pastor in your church or not. What is she? Eh? Is your co-pastor. Even then there's an elders meeting, ministers meeting, and you come up for ministers meeting. You must tell your wife what you agreed. Unless it's a secret. Eh? Because if your wife refuses to stand with you, you will fail. But more than telling your wife, you must beg God to tell her. If God does not tell her, what you told her may not carry weight in her heart. So after you have told your wife, say, excuse me, excuse me, we are going to do a Thanksgiving service. And after the Thanksgiving service, we are going on missions. And God is asking me actually to move this ministry into the bush now because God wants to capture some IDP camps. The wife said, when did God tell you? See, I'm telling you that God told me. You're asking me, when did God tell you? Am I a liar? You say, I just want to ascertain that you had God. Is it when you are sleeping last night and snoring that God told you? You are not be having quiet time. For the past two months because you always pray in the midnight so when did god tell you say you see i've been telling you that people know that i'm a man of god only my wife does not know it the day i will give you fiscal counsel in this house that does not solve problem eh? tell her what god told her and beg god to also do what once god tells her there's no more problem. 
Human beings sharing vision with human beings is not the issue. Until God confirms a vision, the person you are sharing it with is not fully convinced yet. Are you hearing me? Eh? You are hearing me very well. And vision is the beginning of whatever you are going to do. When a man does not have a vision and a clear word of God, visions must come with a confirming word. That you will stand on throughout your life. When they say, what is your mission statement? Where are you going? What are you doing with your life? You should be able to say, the Lord spoke to me clearly. And I'm persuaded that this is what God wants me to do because this is what God told me when I was in secret discussion with him. And if you doubt it, ask my wife. Then, you will not do something else in life. Many people do many things because they don't know what God told them to do. Eh? Eh? Many people do many things in life. Why? They don't know what God told them to do. They are not sure. So they try this. When they see a man who is doing something who looks like he's proper, prospering, what does he do? They also do that. But when you know what God told you to do, come rain, come shine. And if you tell your wife, and your wife, God tells her, then there's nothing you can do about it. You can never change because you will say, that's not what you said God said. That's a check. You're not following me again. Eh? Say, that's not what you told me. And several times, it is your wife that has saved you from entering the bush. Many a time. It's when your wife calls you in the mirror and says, excuse me, what you are trying to do now? I'm not convinced that it is God. I'm not very fully convinced that God can say this and say that. But the time you told me that God told you to go to Kano. Now God is telling you to go to Sokoto. I don't know when he changed. When how God normally change his mind like that. It's not because your friend transferred that you are now trying to go. So when a man does not have a proper vision and a body and does not know what God told him to do, there is no way to judge success. Because just success is to accomplish what God told you to do. Am I right? Am I right? So, if you didn't get the word of God, and many of you didn't get the word of God before you entered ministry, as if you entered ministry and just entered ministry, of course you can grow into ministry. But at the point of stepping out, you must be sure that this is what God is saying concerning your life. And better if a senior man of God or your disciple or your pastor confirms it. Then your wife. Eh? Eh? One man was going to start church. Came and met me. See, I started a church. My wife refused to follow me. I only go there with my two children. Even my two children are beginning to go back now. <laughs> I said, but why did your wife refuse to follow you? Say, he doesn't he didn't tell me, but she refused to follow me. So the church has closed. I said, sorry about that. You made a mistake. When your wife refused to follow you, that's when you should have stopped. Eh? That's the day you would have stopped. There was no need to be going without your wife. And if your wife is very difficult and very stubborn, when I saw the wife, I said, why didn't you follow your husband? I said, I can't follow that man. He's not doing, what is he doing? I say, excuse me, the Bible says submit yourself to your own husband. So you follow, I'm giving two counsel to two different people now. <laughs> but I know that there's no way it's going forward. Eh? You want to be a eunuch, you don't want to marry. Be, be alone. But once you are married, it's important for that vision to be also formed in your heart. Every vision is costly to operate. There's no vision that is not costly. Every vision consumes your whole life, not part of your life. Every vision. You don't do, you don't operate, you don't, you don't execute a vision with some part of your life. No, it's all your life. That's why you're living. And so when your wife has not agreed, because she's going to suffer with you, there was no need. 
to keep going forward. She is too instrumental. So God must help us. Joshua know what God told him to do. Do you know what God told you to do? Eh? Eh? Are you very sure that you have a word of God that says before you enter me that this is what this is what my ministry is based on? I saw God, I talked with man. God told me. Not just that they appointed me in the church to be in the elder's vault. No, it's not enough. If your church appoints me to be an elder, at that point, I think you must go for to prayer. Eh? Eh? Because if God is not confirming it and you take it, you'll also suffer. We are here for God. And it's only when you hear God very well and confirm it. And you know what you're going to do. And normally I should confirm it with a word that you can move on. That's what happened to Joshua. I have to stop. In case you have a question, I'd like you to succeed. Huh? Huh? I'd like you to do what? And be happy. And be joyful. Life is too short to be wasted. I don't want you to be doing something and it's not working. Why I'm referring to this one by one point, I've not gone through it, is so, so that we can check. What I am doing, is it God that told me to do it? Am I sure it's God? Does my wife agree with me? Hallelujah. Eh? Eh? I'm going to ask you to pray. You don't guess with God. God is always definite. And it is lack of this deep communion with God that makes many people not to know. God does not hold information. If God wants you to do something, he will tell you. When a man is not intimately very close with God on, for several years, he won't tell you the first day, for several years, you will never know what God told you to do. If someone will be a prophet, he must know God must tell him. It's a very big presumption. It's a very bad assumption to be doing what God did not tell you to do. As far as God is concerned, the first thing God does, if he's going to use you, and God wants to use you, is to train you. That's what we said yesterday. Do you remember we said it like that? To do what? If you are going to be a, a teacher, what's the first thing about your life? You must be what? School and train to be a teacher. If you are going to be an accountant, what will they do to you first? Go to primary school, go to secondary school, go to higher institution, and you are trained to be an accountant. Training is not optional. And training that is particular, not general. You see, you see in the world system, they use classroom training. They take you through a class of four-year program, 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, 400. You go, go through an exam. That's very good. But in spiritual life, if you are going to be a minister of the word of God, you must go through a one-to-one -to -one training. You must follow somebody that Christ appoints over you to become like Christ. If you don't have that kind of person, then you don't have a, back, a backyard. And sometimes when you are confused, it is in that resolve it. So, so that training is crucial. Communion is crucial. And now, if you don't know the basis on which you entered ministry, and you are just try, doing trial and error, and you are just copying what everybody is doing, even when you are told to start a church, if God told you, if God told you, <laughs> if God had told you to start a church, eh? your own church and another person's church are not the same. Eh? Eh? A church here and a church in Nguamboro cannot be the same. Because they are different localities. That's why all of you who are running branches, 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 branches. I don't know where you saw it in the Bible. Sorry about that. Eh? I didn't see it where you saw it in the Bible. The church in Colossae. The church in Philippi. The church where again? They are not branches of Jerusalem. They are local churches. Eh? So, when I see you doing something that is not the word of God, that's why I will end with no, I may not. I will, I will, 
I will take the word of God. Say this book of the law. Because you can be doing something you say God told you, but if it's not in consonance with the word of God, it's still wrong. Huh? Anybody who is trying to hear God, who has not read the Bible very well, will not hear God accurately. I'm not saying you should go and close your branches. I'm saying even if you wanted to have branches, you should run it well. Don't expect all the branches to produce the same result. A church in Lake Peninsula and a church in Sokoto cannot produce the same result. Of course, all of us are trying to make men to become like Jesus. But you cannot use the same wisdom because they are in different localities. Even the weather. Eh? If you are a pastor of a church that is located in a rural community where there are farmers, and a pastor in a church where there are, where there are big, big, big men with tie every day, eh? you can't run them alike. They are, two local, they are from two different localities. You are following me? Sorry I went into this. I shouldn't be telling you some things because they are private. We are not talking about ecclesiology this night. But some of you have to learn some things because some of you are operating something that is not Bible. And it's not good for you to be operating what is not biblical. Jesus Christ said, I will do what? Build my... So the one you are building, is this his own church or your own? No, I normally like to wait and see. When I see some of you, I say, I normally wait. This church, is it Jesus' church? He said, I will build my church. So this one you are building, is it your own or Jesus' own? Does Jesus have a pattern for the church? Do you see it in the eyes of the apostles? So I'm just giving you an example. So friends, what you are doing, you need to know it. They also need to have the wisdom with you to do it. And the pattern to do it. Because success is never arbitrary. Nowadays, I'm hearing several, several terrible testimonies. And I'm not just hearing them, I'm seeing that many servants of God are looking for power. Eh? And the way they are getting this power is amazing to me. I know a servant of God. The wife came to our house, ran away. That must sleep with women every day who are not his wife to get power. I hear this kind of story every day. Some people, they went to one synagogue, they went to get power. They went to another synagogue. What is power? Did John the Baptist do miracles? Eh? Did he fulfill his ministry? Six months. When people don't know what they are called to do, they will do many things to succeed. What they call success. When I know what I'm going to do, and I, and I know how to, so it's not only to know what to do, to know how to do it and how to get along to fulfill it, then I don't need to be copying anybody. Hallelujah. Eh? That man is succeeding. I don't need to copy him. I thank God for him if he's succeeding. To succeed, it must be according to what God told me to do. You're not following me. Eh? God can tell a doctor. I'd like you to give pediatric treatment to every child that comes to your hospital. Eh? If you had God say that to you, you don't need to go do anything. Just every child that comes, free treatment. The word of God, free treatment. And you can build a big mighty ministry with that. But nowadays we are keyed into something. Everybody that must do ministry must go and start a church. Everybody that must do ministry must go and, and, and buy land. Because as far as you are concerned, that building, that building is too important to you. More than the human beings inside. So, when we don't see well, and we are not properly focused, we will not be able to pursue what we are pursuing well. So, God must help you. You know why I'm doing this? We are in their need in this country. Too many churches, 
Too many, many parishes. Too many men, men of God. Posters everywhere. As if to say we are doing election. Fine, fine ones. More than President Hale, More than Buhari's own. But there is so much darkness around us. You always say the church is the bulwark of truth. There is no truth. Even our own families are collapsing. Pastors are remarrying. One of God is divorcing his wife. And because there is nobody who is going to speak to him, he continues preaching. Because he has personal life charisma. He can wear a good suit. But that day has come and gone. There's a new regime that is going to be introduced very soon. That's why I'm begging you. Stop looking on the popular side. God is not on the popular side. Jesus did serious three and a half years ministry. What he produced was 11 men. Eh? 11 men plus others, all of them together, the whole church of Jesus after three and a half years is 120 people. Is that success? Is that success? Eh? If now you now, so they succeed. No. Eleven men. It's a Peter. It's a James. It's Andrew. Eleven of them that Jesus produced. Fearful men. They are the ones that have changed the world now. Eh? One man trapped me. Trapped me very well. Years back. Years back. He said, let me tell you, sir. I got born again under your ministry. You are foolish. You are, old, you are getting old. I'm a young man, but you are foolish. Let me give you counsel. Go and start church. So that when you collect money from church, you can be doing all these foolish things you are going everywhere doing. Where is your boss? Where is your organ? Where is your church building? If you die now, what will you show? Say, when Jesus died, what did he show? That's what saved me that day. <laughs> I was getting confused. <laughs> you know where the man called me? Hilton Hotel. Just, in, just intimidated me. Say, anything you like, take. They say Coke in dollar. Just take anything you like. They say, sit down, let me tell you. Take anything, no? don't, don't, be, don't, don't pity me. There's money, there's money. In 1988, when you preached in full gospel in Abuja, I got born again that time. Look at me now, look at you. Are you not foolish? Look at the kind of car you're riding. Huh? <laughs> I went back to God. I said, God. <laughs> <laughs> this thing that they are saying is it correct? Am I really foolish? Then Jesus told me, he said, Where was my own car? He said, Donkey I used when I was going to Jerusalem, not a horse. I even borrowed it. Where was my church building? Where are the organ and the vehicles that they used to measure success nowadays? Say, if you want to follow them, follow them. But if you want to follow me, follow me. Eh? I says, Father, I will follow you all the days of my life. Eh? I will not follow the world. I will follow Jesus. If you are not ready to follow Jesus, you cannot succeed. Your success will be a fake success. So let me stop here tonight. Tomorrow, Sub dinner at six. If you come after six, you will not enter. <laughs> Let me warn you in time because the food will finish. Tomorrow I'm going to sub dinner because I like to eat in time. Because I also like to eat tomorrow night. So in case you want to eat with me tomorrow night, be here by four, four thirty. Take your good seat. But want also to close in time. But for tonight, before we pray together, is there any question? Is there any comment? Is there any observation? Is there any contribution? You just raise your hand. Um, we'll take a few tonight and we will pray together. Yes. 
Anybody? Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Anybody? Yes, there is somebody here. Praise the Lord. My name is Pastor James. Sir, as a pastor, somebody prayed or I prayed for years. And uh, after so many years, I know I'm going to be a man of God by divine convention. My father in the Lord told me and I prayed and God said, yes, he approves it. The woman I'm going to marry, then I don't know her. And I was praying. So when we met ourselves, it was divinely arranged by God. Now, we are married. But before the marriage, I told her, I said, I am called of God. She confirms it. Now, I've been going from place to place, ministering. And suddenly now, somebody said, God said that my wife is a minister under his own ministry. So what do I do? What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> what do you do? What do you do? God showed you your wife. And somebody now says, God is appointing your wife a minister under his ministry to leave you. So what do you do? What have you done? Has she gone there? Eh? Please bring her to me. Let me talk with her. In case she's even planning to go. That's why I said some people, ministers do not read Bible. They don't read Bible. They depend on esoteric visions. The Lord told me. The Lord told you what is not in the Bible. You are taking somebody's wife to your ministry. Say the Lord told, and they are very bold. I'm sure they are Pentecostals. I'm sure they are Pentecostals. Only them have seen Holy Ghost before. You think that when you say Pentecostal, will be afraid of you. Holy Ghost is for everybody, not only Pentecostals. You're not following me. Tell your wife that I want to see her. In case she's planning to go somewhere and leave you. Eh? <laughs> I'm not happy with your testimony. If your wife is even thinking of it at all, it means there's something wrong. You see, the way we are brought up, that's why I talk now to you about training, training, training. How can you consider what is not correct? Even to think, to consider what is not right. How can somebody come and tell my wife that her ministry is with him? Why didn't he marry her? <laughs> eh? <laughs> Many servants of God of now, they, they don't read Bible. There's something you don't say. If you see your, your sister in a dream, you go and marry your sister because you saw her in a dream. What did the word of God say? So that's the why we must end up with the word of God. This book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth. People that, you see, is my confession. When a man of God come to the stage and say, God told him that if you comb your hair, you will, you will, be, you, you will su succeed. And you begin to comb your hair. Which verse? Which chapter? Everybody coming to church next Sunday, come out with a handkerchief. I will come with handkerchief, no problem. I want to know what you want to do with it. But you have to tell me which Bible you read. It's not everything you see in a dream that is revelation. Dreams have to be confirmed by the word of God. The same Holy Spirit that gives dreams also wrote the word of God. And he cannot contradict himself. Many things people are doing nowadays does not have biblical authority. And we must start fighting it from now because several young people are confused. Eh? Is that why your wife didn't come tonight? She went to choir practice somewhere else? Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to speak more, but of course, it cannot be right. And once you are married, whether you made mistake or not, it's too late. That mistake will be with you forever. Call it mistake. 
So before you marry, check well. Go through a proper courtship. Do things properly. Life is not a joke. Eh? If a woman cannot catch your vision, then she cannot marry you. Because you are marrying her because of vision. But many of us are careless and because of the kind of shallow background we are coming from. That's what is paining me. When you hear this big man of God, mighty man of God, General Basia, he doesn't have a good background himself. Eh? People are marrying under you. And their marriage is not solid. How would they succeed when their marriage is not solid? So these are serious issues of life. And I want to beg God for you and myself. Life can waste. Life can waste. And let not your own waste. In the name of Jesus. Question. Yes sir. Come here. So that you can say, when you have heard from God, and it's clear to you, you now do your preparation, so that you will be able to know, because... You are preparing. Preparing for what? Mm. If you are not called, if God has not spoken to you, if it is not confirmed, praise the Lord. Another question that uh, when you hear from you, and people start to fear, say, ah, am I to go out of the ministry? Or I to stay in the ministry? Or was I actually called or not? And there are no remedies in the teaching it makes people to fear okay so if you are not called and you are in the ministry already not preferring by money or all that and you know that you are hearing from God and maybe your leader that you are following you say this leader is he actually hearing from God you should be able to give us remedies to certain areas when we have listed these seven ones. If A, if B, when we have failed at A, go back to B, when we are at B, you can sequence it to that level. Thank, Thank you. you. We took this outline as it came in this place we read. And I want to insist that the first outline is preparation. It starts from birth. Not when you are called. It starts from birth. From the day you are born to this earth. Even before you are born again, your preparation starts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't have to hear God call you before you start preparing for what you will do. Amen. Many a time, God tells you what to do. When you are being prepared. It's in those years of preparation that God told you. Moses, I mean, someone was being trained. Maybe they were trained to be a priest. Or God called him to be a prophet. He didn't know. John the Baptist was born to be a prophet. His parents knew when he was born. That doesn't stop his preparation. Because if you are not prepared, you can still not do what God called you to do. Moses never knew what God called him to do until he was prepared in Jethro's house. And he was carrying Jethro's sheep. And one day he came to the desert and he saw a bush burning. And he had a call. Is that alright? So his training preceded his call. Normally, it's only after God has trained a man that he places him where he will serve him. Many people don't know. When Jesus called Peter, he said, come and follow me, I will do what? Yeah, man. Hallelujah. And he began to train him. His major call was apostolic, but he was an evangelist, more or less. It was as he was following Jesus and going that his gifts were manifesting, equipping was coming up, and he entered into his call. So this thing manifests in different ways for different people. How to know your call? But many a time, when God is training you, he's exposing you, he's raising you up, he's training you like they trained Joshua. Joshua didn't even know he was going to replace Moses. But he was just following Moses. Going to the mountain to pray 40 days. Learning how to hear God. And going and going and going. Then, 
One day God began to, just Moses began to say, Lord, since I'm going away, who do you place over these people? Then he called Joshua and said, God is placing you over these people for now. You're going to be in charge. He had been trained. He had started fighting. Then God called him and said, you are going to divide the land for these people. So, so training, it is in training that people learn to hear God. When did, when did Joshua learn to hear God? You remember it was when we were coming from the mountain. And he said, there is, there is war. And the man of God said, this is not war. This is fornication. So it is, the, the process of learning God is when you are in training. You don't, you don't hear God except you are following God in training. It's when now you have gotten to a certain level with God that God begins to say, this is what you will do for me. Hallelujah. So that outline is still authentic like that. Are you confused, sir? Am I, am I convincing? Huh? You're okay now. Do you agree with me? I don't want to agree with me. I want to agree with the word of God. Huh? From your experience, did you hear God the day you are called? Or were you hearing God before you were called? A lot of things have gone wrong. A lot of things have gone wrong. There are too many Christians that don't have a solid basis and background. They don't have deep conviction because they didn't grow to listen to God daily. They didn't hear God speak to them every morning from the word of God. They didn't hear him. So when he came to the point of marriage, come and see the confession. Master, young man, come here. That girl you are pursuing, who told you? Say, God told me. I say, how did God tell you? Say, I dreamed about her last night. I said, that's not how to hear God. You hear God inside your heart. And then you confirm it by a multiplicity of witnesses. Including dream. Dream may be one of them. But you cannot say, I dreamed about a girl. And you, because dream comes from several sources. It can be demonic. It can be because of many activities. It can be the Holy Spirit. If you are looking at a girl very well in the afternoon, you, you, you slept and saw her. It means you are lost after her. Confirm? Confirm? I don't know how you saw your wife. What I say, dream made you to marry a woman. Eh? All that has to stop now. The brethren will be taught the word of God now. Eh? That's why we are calling this meeting now. The brethren will be taught the Bible now. We must be taught Bible before we even think about hearing God inside our ear. First of all, is to know what? This word of God. The word of God is given by inspiration from God and is profitable to make a man of God proficient. Our deficiency is this trying to hear God when you have not read the Bible. So many people are saying many things that cannot stand biblical authority. Eh? Are you hearing me? There are many things you are doing. I was in a meeting. One lady said, Go and take sand from the front of your enemy's house. Eh? Prophesy into the sand. I say, which verse? You're not following me. When did Jesus do it? Whatever you didn't see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't see in the house of the apostles, have no biblical authority. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the practice of who? Acts of the apostles is practice of what? And the prophets. Anything you are practicing that you don't find there, what is your authority? And because we come, a very, we come from a very fetish background, many of us are becoming fetish. What are you carrying sand from the front of your enemies? Who is your enemy? Are we beginning to wrestle against flesh and blood? Eh? That's my trouble. Many of us have came up from a background where there is no solid word of God. One brother was going to marry a sister. I said, you can't marry her. You can't marry her. He said, why? I said, this lady, you are the man of, of the world. This lady is not a man of the world. It's a woman of smell. People that smell demon. Hmm. Hmm. 
Somebody has entered now. Hmm. There's a presence. There's a presence. Hmm. <laughs> the man said, Okay, if there's a let's let's pray now. I said, hmm. I said, This is how you will sleep with a woman for one year every night. Hmm. I said, We'll soon pack out. There's no need to try this. <laughs> and I discovered a lot of rubbish going on. Rubbish. So I was listening to one expo- expo- exposition. The woman of God from Ukraine was exposing one of our ministers. And I was just weeping in my heart. I said, this is the name of the Lord that is being profaned. And the way church, the way people see church in our country now, the impression of church, so some of us, they don't even regard us as ministers because we are not doing those kind of things. Anything you are doing that is not Jesus, forget it, is wrong. You must build according to what? Whatever you are doing that is not Jesus, excuse me, is a lie. And in case you are here and you are beginning to gravitate towards going to collect power, the only place to collect power is in God's presence. Lay your life there. If God wants to give you power, there are nine gifts of the Holy Ghost. One of them is power. The one may be your trance. The one may be faith. Eh? It's a body ministry. Stop admiring these brothers who are saying they have power. Power move, power move, but they didn't see the power. I was preaching with one of them in one meeting, one conference. Sorry, I'm talking about myself. I'm not used to, but I to tell you, when I finished preaching, say this boy has just preached. This boy has just taught the word of God wonderfully. Now all of you stand up now. Let's exercise power. <laughs> I say for what? His power for just to demonstrate something. And I say, Holy Ghost, this man must not come and spoil what we are doing here. The man said, close one eye, open one eye, power! Nothing happened. <laughs> I said, nothing will happen here today. The man did, did, I'm going to miss my flight. I said, you are going to miss it if you don't go to the airport now. We are doing something serious. You are closing one eye. Foolishness. Their days are numbered. If you like to follow God, follow God. You see, I'm jealous for the word of God. If all of us here agree to go back to our, 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 our churches and preach the truth, this country will not be long before it will be set free. But there's no more truth. Eh? You come to church at 9 o'clock and go by 4 o'clock. Word of God is 10 minutes. You take offering for one hour, announcement two hours. Women in group four, women who have K leg, women who are born in October, all this foolishness. When will it stop? You dance around the church to drop 50 naira. Every day you carry big pan, nothing is inside it. Even they are asking for change when they are passing the place around. Can't you see how foolish it is? You do this for years. You can't finish a, a building you started at the street as, as it hasn't come out of foundation yet. When will you learn to assess what you are doing, whether it is correct? Is that how Jesus built his church? Eh? I want you to succeed. Stop copying people who are not doing what is right. Somebody can inspire you, but you have your own pattern that God gives you. Eh? You are not following me. Are you understanding what I am saying? Some of you are very young. For you to begin to make mistake now. Don't do what Jesus did not do. Whatever Jesus did not do is wrong. Finish. The foundation of the church is built on Jesus, the cornerstone, and on the apostles and prophets. So when you don't see what Jesus practiced in Acts, you didn't see it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why are you doing it? Madam, ask your husband when you get home. That thing you are doing, is it in the book of Acts? Is it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? When did Peter carry oil and be, and be run, 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 poured on cement? Ask your husband. If he cannot give you reason, cannot show you in the Bible, tell him that you have to go back again to prayer. Our generation is in trouble. The only thing that can save any country anywhere in the world is what? The truth. 
When there's no light, darkness overtakes a land. Once the truth stops, there's no other way that God helps any nation, any church, any community, any family except by light. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Once there's no light, darkness will take over a place. But when light comes, whim, what happened to darkness? It doesn't argue with light. So no matter the trouble, no matter the darkness that has come into any place, demons, it lacks backwardness, everything. The only way to deal with it, him, put on the switch. Once light comes, all the cockroaches in your, in your kitchen, when there's no light in your kitchen, you told me, say, there's no cat in my house, there's no rat in my house, there's no cockroach, it's a, it's a lie. Put up the light and go and sleep. Come out after five minutes and put on the light. Huh? All the rats will come out. All the cockroaches, what will they do? Your sink will be full of cockroaches. Because they operate in darkness. But once you put on light, bim, what happened to all the cockroaches? Because they don't operate in light. So if we don't switch on the light, our nation will continue to be what it is. I see many Christian schools that are, are, have Christian proprietors. They are the miracle center of nowadays. Eh? You study a school and you're a Christian and your school is miracle center where people who want to do exam and practice, they go there. If any of your teachers say, stop, you will sack her. How will our country be saved? Some of you are doctors and you still do abortion in your clinic. So how will Nigeria be saved? Eh? Government cannot save Nigeria. They have not saved themselves. How would they save another person? This is where light comes out of. And when our background is not correct, that's where the trouble lies. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Can I take one more question or two? Then we are going. Yes, somebody. Don't ask a difficult one, no? <laughs> it's not difficult, sir. Okay. As a young lady, a young man approaches you and said he wants to marry you, and somehow you had peace within you, and you went ahead and married him. He turns out to be a pastor. And somehow, somehow, within you also, you, thought, you felt, I'm not cut out for this. He, he felt what? You, that's the lady now felt, I'm not cut out for ministry to be a pastor or something. Because it is believed that once your husband is a pastor, you're also a pastor. Yes. And then you feel, I'm not cut out for ministry things. Because I don't have that conviction. Or maybe God has not spoken to me. Or I'm not prepared for it. And then some years down the line, your husband now said... You are the wrong person for me. I, I married the wrong person just because you're not cut out for the things of the ministry. And then you now go by and said, me, I'm not the ministry type. So my question is, is it possible for a lady to marry a pastor and then for her to say, I'm not cut out for ministry? Is it possible, sir? Is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is this an example practical or is it what you are thinking in your head? Sir? Is this example, you are, is it practical or what you are thinking in your head? It is very practical, sir. Uh, yes, it sir. happened to a human being. Yes, sir. That's what I'm saying. We are in trouble. We are in trouble. Number one, this peace you always have when a man proposed to you. Peace. Before, didn't you have peace before the man came? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because everybody say, I have peace, I have peace, I have peace. So before, we were you scattered? So having peace is not a confirmation that God spoke to you. Okay. You must hear God first. Say the man spoke to me and I just felt peace. I said before, what did you feel? So we are not marrying well. That's the first problem. The churches are not taking marriage seriously. You marry at first sight, love at first sight, before you discuss important issues. That's number one. I think servants of God, we must begin to scrutinize because marriage is a matter of life and death. Forget about people who say it's not better for us. Don't mind them. 
That better for what is a commitment that it is for life. Until death do you part. Once you sign it, you cannot be a pastor and be marrying many women. So before you sign, you must know all you need to know. That's why they have six months at least of what they call courtship. Where you don't send gifts, you don't send a uh, mima, you don't send flower, you don't send anything. Two of you are praying and talking under supervision. So that we will know whether you want to marry a pastor or not. And whether you are prepared, even when you want to marry a pastor, are you prepared to be a pastor's wife? If you are not prepared, then we help you to get prepared before you go and sign. So too many things are going wrong because we are not going according to principles. Honestly, sometimes I just weep for the church. They do family week once a week, once a year. And that's the all. And too many people, young people are making mistakes. And too many pastors' wives are unhappy. Too many pastors' wives are unhappy. They won't talk so that they will not say that the ones who are spoiling the ministry. But there's no ministry. There's no ministry. So please. I went to a church and when I heard about all the complaints, I told pastor, close the service. I want to speak to only singles. Those who have made mistakes, let them continue their mistake. I want to speak to singles who have not made mistakes. It looks cruel. But sometimes the mistakes is so complicated. Eh? Sometimes a woman living with a man is so unhappy, it doesn't contribute to what the man is doing. How will the man succeed? And there's um, coming in bitterness and hatred. There's no more communion. There's no more communication. They can't speak to themselves. They can't pray for themselves. And this is of praying for someone to die. One person is praying for another person to die. It's harrowing. And all this because we're not giving ministry to the flock. We're not giving the flock ministry. We are not. I've told you, when I come to church, there's one moment I don't like. When they finish, what's the order of service? Opening prayer, next. Praise and worship, next. Congressional prayer, next. Bible reading, next. Message, next. Announcement. When announcement is going on, somebody is going around with paper. What is he doing? Counting people's head. I don't like it. Who are they? Who are these people who are counting their head? The last Sunday we were 200 and they contributed 2 million. Who are they? Who, those who contributed that money? It means you don't have a vision of what you are doing. Eh? You don't know what you are doing. There's no youth ministry. Young people are not being taught how to hear God. Not in their homes, not in the church. And they are growing their beer and carving it very well and trying to marry. So, my sister, that's a problem. We can't solve it. Only God. So let's keep praying that it will not happen again after, on, after, this time, after the ones that have happened. Can't continue making mistakes. Maybe we should call a youth meeting now and talk about this because too many young people are hooked on the internet, they watch pornography, they are being excited, they want to marry, thinking that marriage is just sex. After two months, three months, they are not caught for ministry. What is the meaning of that? What are you caught for? Who caught you? I'm not cut for ministry. What are you cut for? Eh? And actually what she says is very serious. To be a pastor's wife is not a joke. You need to be prepared for it. So if she's a friend, can't say her that she should just keep growing and keep bearing. That they should not scatter their marriage because of ministry. And if I, were, if I see the man, I would say, Sir, can you step back a bit so that you can carry your wife along? 
Step back a bit. So that you can carry her along. There's no need to be preaching when your wife is crying. Sometimes when you are preaching on the pulpit, your wife is just crying. Her eyes are red. They say she's praying. She's crying. She's crying. I have made a mistake. There's too much unhappiness in the ministry. Too much on anywhere I go, I like to speak to ministers. And I find the same result. There's too much unhappiness. And an unhappy person can never succeed. The best success, the people that succeeded most in ministry are those who had happy homes. Jonathan Edwards, this man in England, the tabernacle, that Baptist pastor, who is, what's his name now? That Baptist pastor, what's his name now? Oh, in England. Success comes from a happy home. A man that is not happy inside can never succeed. You won't sleep well. You won't, have, you won't be happy. You won't have joy. And when there's no joy, are you, are you still a Christian? Rejoice again and again. I say, rejoice. And the ministers gather in this country, there's too much unhappiness. I discovered there's so much unhappiness among ministers. If they open up and tell you what they are going through, but the Lord has come with help from his sanctuary. Eh? We will pray. The devil will have no place in your marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. Finally, one more question. <laughs> yes, my brother. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> yes. Uh, yesterday, you told us that men who are too careful not to make mistakes can live succeed. Now, my question is this. Somebody has Moses. I mean, you are under the tutelage of a man of God. And uh, you are becoming too careful at everything that your Moses tell you because you don't want to make mistake. Uh, like your Moses asks you to do something, you are careful, you want to uh, try to see. Maybe you have not seen it before. Or uh, you, you want to be very sure it's in the Bible before you do it. Uh, can somebody succeed that way? Or, let me put it this way. Is he still in the capacity of Joshua to correct Moses? Or Moses are always beyond mistake. Moses uh, what? Moses can never make mistake. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that is he in the capacity of Joshua to correct Moses? If he discover Moses uh, has done something wrong. Now, the second question, sir. No, no, no. One at a time. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The context in which you ask your question is not the context of Joshua because Moses has died. He said, Be strong and courageous and do what I said to you to do. So, when a man is now in charge, then he should be bold if he wants to succeed. To be too careful is not, will be not be on your side. It's good to be cautious, but not too cautious. Is that all right? Is that all right? But when you're under a disciple or under a pastor, you can't be cautious because you should do what he said you should do. Eh? Whatever your pastor or your disciple or your master says for you to do, what do you do? Do it. But the trouble you have is that this question is coming in a context. Our modern day church has a problem. The problem is that they don't ask questions. There's no love relationship between you and the person you are serving. Otherwise, there's nothing wrong with a junior correcting a senior if it's respectful. Huh? If you told me to do something I don't believe in, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with my asking you, sir. Can you explain it more to me? I don't believe. And it's no offense at all. But our modern day church is offensive to say that. See, I told you to go and do it. Who are you to be asking me a question? So everybody is afraid of his pastor. Eh? Many of you have never seen your pastor eating. You have never seen where he undressed. You always see him suit. And he's always coming from here. I don't know why this church, they have no door here because this is where we should be coming from. 
One of God should drive to the back. Ten minutes of service after praise worship is coming from here. When he come, you come, sit down and say, Can I get them? Um, where is the treasurer? How much did we collect last Sunday? Yes, 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 yes. Any report? Then he comes like a magician or an angel, a ghost. Once he comes, everybody stops. Everybody stop what they are doing because one of God like, and clap first. Then some soldiers are standing here in case of Boko Haram, if they come and capture him. It's creating fear. It's creating fear. That's not church. Church is a family. My son can say, sir, explain what you are saying to me. I want to understand it well. How can you not ask your pastor a question? So how will he help you? So this kind of thing you are saying is what happens in our situation where, you know, the man of God is not an angel. He's not Jesus. He's a man of God. He can make mistakes. And the best man of God is man that says, I'm sorry I made a mistake. That's humility. There's no man of God we see him for him. That's what happened to the Roman Catholics and they have become Pope now. Papa. No, brother, you can ask your leader. Say, sir, you have told me to do something. I have prayed about it. I'm not convinced. Say, let's pray more. Give, let's give it more time. Let's pray more. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a love relationship. You say, I used to call you servant, and I call you what? Friends. Can you imagine that Peter called Jesus and said, Sir, don't talk about death again in this, in this place. You can't call us out from our, from our fishermen and say, Die. D die for what? <laughs> Why do you want to die? Is Peter telling Jesus, Say, Why do you want to die? Don't discuss it again. And Jesus was going to keep quiet. But when he saw the other disciple, he said, if I don't correct it, he said, not say, get behind me, Satan. But Peter still kept asking questions. What pushed Peter in front of the other disciples was that Peter kept asking questions. Peter kept, Peter kept asking questions. Our church is in a trouble because we don't ask questions. There's no relationship between pastor and, and the people. You don't go to his house. You don't ask him questions. You don't relate with him. So it's a mystic. I would say, Jesus, the word was made flesh. And what? We are among us. And we did what? We beheld his glory. We touched him. We handled him. We saw him. We had him. We saw him. We touched him. We handled him. We experienced him. That's ministry. So all of you who are afraid to go and talk to your, to your senior pastor, when you go to his house, you pray for one, one 40 days, then you come. Excuse me, sir. When you go, yes. I'm sorry, sir. I'm coming. I will come back next week. <laughs> see, you see now. <laughs> you see now. Because you think it will curse you. How can you curse your children? I wish that when you become a general overseer, you will change your face. It's a friendship. And you should be able to say, I'm wrong. You are right. Nothing wrong with it. I'm fully by me, human being. I can make mistakes. I can give a wrong counsel. Are you hearing me? And when a junior person brings a superior argument, let's do it. It doesn't take anything from me. Paul said, Follow me as I do what? If I don't follow Christ, stop following me. I wish you are going to bring a change. Some of you are sitting here listening to me. You are going to become a general overseer very soon. I wish you are going to bring a change to the ministry. It's a relationship. You are not there and they are there. No, no, no. We are on the same platform. Actually, it is this design that is causing us trouble. And this is not even a perfect church design. What if it is a church design? You won't even see me. We are coming from inside the Holy of Holies then there should be a big rail here. And this gap is too small. You have push you back a bit. So there's a clergy, there's a laity. Huh? All those things have caused us trouble. But so when you come to church, if you have, a, if you have a, a hymn, you have a psalm, you have a word, let's do it one by one. Let everybody contribute so that everybody will be blessed. 
But you see, I've been preaching to you since yesterday. It's not right. If we didn't have this interaction now, I won't hear that thing he said. I won't interact with my sister here. We will not know ourselves. We are strangers. That's not church. So God must help us. We can't do everything at one time, but we must have it. There must be a change. Christ is the only one. Not these things you are seeing. The only example we have of church is Christ. Are you hearing me? And we must go back again to the pattern. Let's pray tonight. Let's pray tonight. Let's pray tonight. Can you pray for yourself? Can you pray quickly? Let's just pray tonight. When last did you go on retreat? When last did you retreat with God? When last did you have a time of eating with God? Have you become too busy? Have you become so very busy that you don't have space again in your calendar for God? Even your quiet time has suffered. The prodigal son said, I will return to my father. I will return to my father. I will say to him, Father, you have a father. The first thing that God wants from you is to be a child and he a father, not a minister. When last did you find time to spend alone with God? Do you have an inner chamber, a closet life? Have you become too busy that you have not been hearing God by yourself now? Please just pray now. Just pray now. A brother said, somebody can be discouraged. I said, I didn't hear God. Don't be discouraged. Keep doing what you are doing. Keep doing what you are doing. I keep asking God to confirm it for you. Don't retire from the ministry. But say, Lord, I need a word to confirm to me that you are the one that called me. I need you to confirm it to me. I want to be sure that I am not doing what I should not be doing. So I can zero in and face it. Lord, help me. You talk to Joshua. You told him what he would do. Tell me also what I will do. Even if a man of God told you, say, Lord, confirm it. So that when there is a crisis, so that when there is a crisis, <coughs> life is too brief. Life is too short to waste it. Life is too short to make too many mistakes. We want to, to walk deliberately with God from this meeting. Pray. God hears prayer and answers prayer. The years are going. You must succeed. You can't succeed when you are not sure of what God said to you. Moses, my servant, has gone. It is your turn now. All these years of training, it is time to affect them. It's time to take charge. But tonight, we are learning again that nothing can replace our communion with you. Nothing must come before our relationship with you. And so therefore, Lord, I pray for them. 
that father as you are speaking to them you also make a provision for them to come back for some of us ministry has become so heavy and pressure has become so much that we don't even have a time to relax <coughs> but tonight Lord whatever you will do for us do it so that we can return to our first love in the name of Jesus Satan the Lord rebuke you concerning God's children this Lord rebuke you concerning them Lord we are sorry we used to love you but now we love something else ministry has become our idol <coughs> Lord we, we repent we are going to be deliberately going to refuse more ministry and focus on your face again Lord help us <coughs> do something to us let the rest of this weekend be times of refreshing in your presence thank you father as your children go they have just prayed tonight and said Lord I have a need Lord meet them at their point of need address their issues teach us to pray more than to try to use our muscle to solve our problems Surely our sisters who normally like to use their muscle that they will pray more until you resolve every issue even our children we are begging you they will not bring a reproach to the name of the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ thank you again because you will do beyond what we can ask or what we can think as we return here tomorrow we are believing you that Lord we are going to come and find favor in your eyes thank you in Jesus' name we pray. As the deer for, the for this and other messages, contact Refuge Bookshop, number 19, Mayura Road, Nabi Plaza, opposite Zikta Model Schools, Barnawa, Kaduna. Telephone numbers 0805 845 5719, 0703 456 8035. Email address threshesteam at yahoo.com or you could visit our website at www.threshesteam.org.ng.